Hello, everyone. Welcome to the January 2013 edition of the Professor Messer A Plus Study Group. This is a new year. Happy New Year, everyone. Welcome again. We try to do one of these every month, and I try to make sure that I take your questions and we get some of those questions put out here. I'm also, if you are live watching in the chat rooms, if you're watching a replay of this, follow us every month. Why not hop in here and give me your question interactively? Usually there are a lot of great follow-up questions when I start going through the Q&A that people have sent. And you can always check to see what's going on on the Professor Messer website at professormesser.com slash calendar. I try to keep that updated as much as possible. And if it's not updated, send me a message and prod me. Sometimes that helps if you poke me a little bit and say, can you please update your calendar, mister? And I try to get out there and do that. This study group is something we do every month. And it's something I like getting the feedback for what you guys are doing and how you're doing it. And uh, uh, if you have ever looked at our videos on our website, absolutely free. Every video I make is absolutely free. Everything that I do, I put on the website. So a little bit different than other study systems you may have seen in the past where everything was behind a paywall. Not so here. Everything is absolutely completely free every single minute of it. The difference, though, is that I do have offline versions you could take. Not everyone's connected to the internet. Not everybody has high speed. Not everybody's able to watch and stream from YouTube. And in those cases, I do have offline versions that you can buy. You can find out more about those at professormesser.com slash download dash A plus. You might want to take advantage of that. Another thing people have often said, how can we help you? Because you're giving all these things away for free and I don't take donations. But if you wanted to help us and what we're doing in every bit of way, and this this really does make a difference in, in all of these little bits of ways, uh, you can subscribe to us, to our YouTube channel at professormesser.com slash YouTube. And you can follow me on Twitter at professormesser.com dot com slash Twitter. I'd love for YouTube just to give me a channel where I could stream directly without having to go through Google Plus. That would be awesome. The only way they're going to do that is if they look at my channel and say, gosh, you have a lot of subscribers. We should probably do something here and make sure that you're able to get those subscribers the information they need through a live video stream. But I do hope to have some Google Plus video streams that stream onto YouTube happening here very, very shortly. We're going to try that out and see how it works. Every week, I send out a message to you and say, send me your questions. And a lot of the questions that we get are also questions we may have had in the past. All of our study groups are archived. They're on the Professor Messer website. And if you ever wanted to see, for instance, just last month, if you went and looked at December, you would be able to see the kind of processors and CPUs that you might need to know for your A-plus exam. You would have to know laser printer parts and other printer parts that you might need to know. You'd learn what RDP was. You would know the differences between a Windows domain and a Windows workgroup. You would, I would give you a lot of information about the differences between the 701, 702 exams and the new 800 series. There are questions about passing the 701. Can you just take the 802 and be certified? And quick answer is no, but you want the long answer on last month's study group. And the last question from last month, if you missed it, was after passing the first exam, how long can you wait before taking the second exam? So. All of those questions, we won't answer this month because I just did those. So go back, watch the one from last month. All of this information is in there, and I'll bet there'll be something that you can take advantage of as well. If you have your A-plus certification, you know that you can continue to maintain that certification and renew that certification through the use of continuing education units. And this, this uh, study group that we do does count towards those continuing education units. If you care to look at that, uh, I got a really nice message this month from the CIO at, um, at CompT. I was using this big, long URL. He said, hey, I got you a short one. So all you need to do now is go to certification.comptia.org slash CEUFAQ, and you can learn all about renewing your CompTIA A-plus certification. Why take a test every three years? Why let your test, your exam certification expire? There's much easier ways to go about doing this. This is just one way to do it. Um, there are many, many ways to renew your A-plus certification. New news on my website. I promise we're getting to questions in just a moment. There are a lot of announcements this month. There's a lot that's happened over the new year. All of my 800 series exams, starting uh, starting with the 801, and really everything I'm going to create of my training videos going forward will be closed captioned. This is something I've been wanting to do 
For years, I have people in my family that are hard of hearing. They need closed captioning on their television. They happen to be highly technical as well. And they have a hard time with my videos. If you've ever tried to do closed captioning on YouTube, the automatic closed captioning, not so good. Not so good with these technical things. But I wanted to do closed captioning not just on YouTube, but also the videos that people will buy. And there's some unique capabilities as well. I want to show you some of the things you can do with this. I found some really, really neat technologies to be able to work with around closed captioning. And I'm pretty excited about it because not only does it caption and provide you with those capabilities, it also provides you with a way to see interactively what's going on. So I'm going to show you my screen. So this is the Professor Messer website. Uh, I'm starting to roll out. Captioning is already on every single YouTube video. But here's another feature. So if you play a video on YouTube, like here's one on network cabling, and you play it, I'm not going to have the audio up. Maybe we will. Let's see. Can I have the audio up on this a little bit? It is the foundation of the so communication that we're using. This is me talking on here. Only and if you click the closed captioning sure button, that the foundation is absolutely And it will solid. put the closed captioning on the screen. Planning out which is good. Let's pretend we can't even hear it. So now you can see what's there. And you can change the closed captioning on YouTube so it's actually dark, which is probably works better on my particular videos. But now at the bottom, just underneath this, is an interactive transcript. As I'm talking, the entire transcript is under my video, and it's tracking exactly what I am saying. So you can read along. You don't have to read the transcripts. Maybe you just want to or read the, the closed captioning. Maybe you just want to turn off the closed captioning. That's, that's useful as well. Uh, in fact, if you scroll down, you can read the entire video. And if you think, this is where I'd really like to be, you can click a word, and it will move the video to what you just clicked on. That's pretty awesome. So it's an easy way now to scan through. You can search for text and see what's there. Very, very useful to have that functionality, especially if you're from another language, you're hard of hearing, you just want to be able to understand what I'm saying. Maybe I'm saying a word, and you're like, that's a technical word I've not heard before. What in the world is he talking about? Maybe his twang here in the southern United States isn't something you can follow. Maybe you won't know exactly what he's saying. Now it's spelled out for you. So you don't have to worry about accents. You don't have to worry about missing a word. It's all in there. I'm really excited about this. Can you tell? I'm really happy about having it there. Uh, was not was not always able to provide that. It costs money to provide closed captioning. I have a third party that does this. Um, so we're very, very fortunate that we're now able to start doing that. That's that's really awesome that, that we have that functionality. So feel free to see what's on YouTube. The interactive transcripts will be uh, put on these videos. I already have 55 of them. They'll be deployed over this next week or so. You'll start to see them. Just show up on the screen when you start looking at them. So another good reason to watch the videos on the Professor Messer website because you, you don't get the interactive transcripts over on YouTube. You just only get the closed captioning. Let's look also a number of questions you guys have sent in over the, the weeks, over the months, really years. We've been doing these uh, study groups for quite some time. The interesting part about what I get are some constant questions. Every month I get similar questions. And I thought instead of spending time on the study group answering really the same question every single time or not answering it, and it's a frequent question that you'd like the answer to, I just made a section on the website where I've just started making videos that just have the answer to those questions. And you can find that at professormesser.com slash FAQ. And that will list out for you things like, what topics should I study to prepare for my exam? Are these videos on my website updated with the latest content information? Um, I failed my certification exam. What can I do now? You know, things like that, that you need to know this information. You don't ha have time to wait for another study group. But it's something that I can just make, put on the website, and I'll just keep adding to those as we go along. More, more announcements. And, and perhaps my last announcement, finally, of the study group is that uh, I have hit 10 million videos viewed across both YouTube and previously I used some other services. Nine million of those have been on YouTube. And I want to express my thanks to you, everybody who watches these videos, everybody who uses these to get their certifications. You've all been a part of this. It's been incredibly exciting on our side to have that kind of success with what we're doing. And it's just more motivational to me. You are, you're telling me that you want more videos and I'm absolutely motivated now to get more videos of different topics and different ideas and different podcasts. And I've got a whole slew of things in my head that will be happening along those lines. So something we, we celebrated over the holidays, and we thought that was pretty awesome. And I wanted to thank everyone for making that happen. Thank you so much.
Let's now start with uh, some questions. So if you've never been on one of our study groups before, you know I ask you questions as we're going. This isn't just something you watch. This isn't just something you sit back and do. I want you to participate. So if you go to uh, this website, vot.rs, or if you have a QR code reader on your mobile device, grab your iPhone, grab your Android device, pop up your QR code reader. You can just take a picture of the screen right now and be able to get that QR code. Let me make sure that you can actually legitimately get that QR code. There you go. We're going to do uh, one question to start things off. This one is an answer you know the answer already. This question is pretty easy, which was, how long have you been studying for your A-plus certification? You can go to vot.rs in another window. So you can pop up another tab, pop open another window, go on your mobile device to vot.rs. It will ask you for a number. The number for this question is 975187. 975187. Go to vot.rs, 975187. And let me bring up on my side what that looks like on the vote.rs so we can track what's going on. Yes, I'm going to see your answers to these. That's that's the point, isn't it? Being able to watch what goes on. Wouldn't that be the fun part of all of this? So I, what's also nice about this and having this available is that I can see and get a feel for the things that you would like to know about. So this gives me an idea of how much you've really been studying for this A+, the kind of topics I should focus on. Should they be things that are really more about the CompTIA exam, or should they be some more advanced topics associated with this? We have quite a mix this month. Again, go to vot.rs975187, and you can vote how long you've been studying. Less than a month. Six of you so far are less than a month. We've got a good mix between all the way up to six months. And then some of us have been studying for a while. I know when I was studying for my Security Plus, I started with Security Plus and then Network Plus and then A Plus. I did them backwards. Don't ask. It's a, it's a long story. But I did mine backwards, and I started to get into it. Like Security Plus is pretty broad. Uh, Network Plus, I knew a lot of the technologies already. That was a little bit better. A Plus is super broad. That, that just has a lot of topics across a lot of different things that were going on. So I had to spend a lot of time going back. I'd been in the industry 15, 20 years, and now I had to go back and understand more about speeds of memory. I didn't even think about it. I just got the memory stuck in a machine. I was done. And people think I can take the A+, because I know how to put a piece of memory in a machine. Yeah, but what's the memory doing? How does it talk to the CPU? What is memory addressing about? Uh, those speeds, are they important? What happens if I put a faster speed memory in to a slower speed bus? Those types of things are pretty important to know, especially if you're planning to do those pieces. So, so you want... Uh, the the idea is that you want to be able to know as much as you can. And you can see here quite a good mix along these lines. It's nice to also get a feel for what you guys are doing when you're studying for the exam, you guys and your gals, to be able to make that that information happen. So that's that's a good mix, and I appreciate you participating in that. I think that's going to be an important part of what we're doing today is going through all of those pieces. Let's give you an update on the A-plus exam. There are some things that have happened with the A-plus exam recently. The, By the way, the 800 series exam is indeed here. So those of you that come to the website, you sometimes you're still asking me, hey, when's that A-plus exam going to be updated? The A-plus exam hasn't been updated in a while. Well, it was updated last year, last calendar year. It's been updated for a number of months now. You can take both exams, however, um, right now as well. You can take the old exam and the new exam. Compte is really good about this. So if you've been studying, you've been studying, you've been studying, you don't want a new exam to show up and then you have to restudy everything. So what they do is allow you an overlap. So it's a little confusing right now with the overlap that you, you don't have a situation you can really help out with this. The overlap, you can take the old one or you can take the new one. Well, which one do you take is a bit of a question. We'll talk more about that in today's study group. But right now, you're able to take both. I think, I think you should always consider taking the newest one first. You should say, I'm going to take the new exam. But the new exam is very different. There's new topics. There are new types of questions. There will be a few performance-based questions on the exam. There will be some things that uh, topics you've never studied if you studied the old exam. So things to think about along those lines as well. You can always get the download require download the exam requirements at the CompTIA website. You can find a link at the top of every page of the video for you be so you'll be able to know exactly what you want to to learn for the particular exam that you want to take. You can't just learn the 700 series and go in and sit for the 800 series and expect you're going to do well. There's going to be questions that you'll have no idea where those come came from. Let's now go into the questions you send me 
every month. Let's go into some that, that have come up. Before we do, I have a question for you. What type of raid? What type of raid is commonly called striping? What type of raid is commonly called striping? I wonder why it's called striping. That's a different kind of question. Is it grab your mobile device, pop open a window, go to vot.rs, and use the number 375702 to tell me what type of raid is commonly called striping. You can also click on the QR code there. What type of raid is commonly called striping? I bet some of you already know this one. I, I of course, have videos that talk about raid and talk about uh, how that works. And of course, that's another good question that may be asked of you when you are on your A plus certification. Let's have a look at how things are going so far. What raid is commonly called striping? That's, we got a good mix here. I may have asked a good question. People wondering, what? What are you talking about? Raid called striping. It's like a it's like a uh, raid zero and raid one are neck and neck, it seems. And we've got raid five. Nobody see four people thought, well, it's raid five. One said, aha, you're not fooling me, it's raid one plus zero. Some of you may be right. Some of you may be wrong. Some of you may be kind of right. I wonder what we've, and it really is neck and neck. This is one where the terminology we use in IT can be so confusing at times. The way that we look at how we name things isn't completely obvious at times. And this is a perfect example of how things aren't completely obvious. You, you know it works a certain way, and yet it's called something different. That's almost always the situation you run in with RAID. So now we get to learn something relating to RAID. Let's, before I give you the answer, let's go back to our presentation. I'm going to take you through a question that was sent to me this week. This question came from DT that said, in a dynamic partition, so we're talking about a Windows operating system, why doesn't striping add fault tolerance? Why not? And of course, I don't have a way to, to, to ask these things back to the user, or at least I have no easy way to get a conversation going. You really just send these things in. Um, and, and that brought up a question to me that, well, are we really talking about striping? Are we talking about something else? So let's first think about what we're talking about. RAID 0 is called striping. So that is what that kind of answers the question that we had about is it RAID 0, RAID 1, RAID 5, or RAID 1 plus 0? Or at least, this is one way you can stripe. We'll talk about that in a moment. The striping that is here on RAID 0 is one that, um, that I find to be really, really interesting, but not really used so much in practical terms, primarily because what we are doing with this RAID is whenever we need to write a file, and you have one single disk, you write the file to the disk. Now what we've done is we've put two physical disks in a machine, and when we write a file, we don't write it to one disk. We split the file up into pieces. We put part of the file on one disk, and we put part of the file on the other disk. So the file is physically separated between those disks. Now, why in the world would you want to do split a file between physical drives? That doesn't seem safe to me. That doesn't seem even useful. Uh, obviously, the RAID array that we've got created when you read the file reads it from both drives and you see a single file on your screen. But this gives you a lot of performance. D writing to, to traditional disk drives, to moving, spinning platters can be kind of slow. So having that there on two drives, ideally even with two controllers, can write really fast. It improves the performance of the reading and the writing to those drives. But as you've probably figured out, you're striping. Half the file is on one hard drive. Half the file is on another hard drive. What happens when you lose a hard drive? Well, you lose half the file. What good is half a file? <laughs> not, not a lot. There's not a lot of use out of half a file. There's no redundancy with RAID 0 and the striping. So that's an important consideration. If somebody says, I've got a RAID 0 here, and it's striping between these two. I've got two one terabyte drives. That's two terabytes of storage, and I'm striping the information. Well, that's great. I hope one of those drives doesn't go bad. I hope we don't lose a drive, because that would be bad. Normally, you would take everything from these drives. They look like one big drive to your operating system, and you want to do plenty of backups. Get those backups going. Now, that's different, of course, than mirroring. RAID 1 
is called mirroring. Those, those terms, striping and mirroring, they sound so familiar. They sound so similar, rather, to each other. The difference in mirroring is it's just like looking in a mirror. One hard drive is absolutely identical to the other drive. When you write a part of a file onto one disk, it writes the exact same block on the other disk. So you have an exact duplicate of what's coming through and being stored on those drives. If you lose a drive, then that that's not really a problem. The pro however, you're using twice as much disk space as you normally would. That's, that's, of course, a concern. These are two one terabyte drives. How much storage do you have? One terabyte. Wait, I have two terabytes total. No, no, you're mirroring. Half of your available space is now being taken up by this RAID configuration. So the redundancy here is fantastic, though. If you're talking in an environment where data is important, you have servers that have databases on them, you have a web server that has to be up all the time, mirroring's fantastic. This is how most people will handle some type of redundancy on their servers, in their data center. It's one of the methods to be able to make that happen. And it's kind of nice to have the mirror there. If you ever need a copy of that disk, you've got two copies. So you're, you're protected. Now, this isn't backing it up, of course. If you were to overwrite a file, it overwrites them on both disks. If you accidentally take an enormous 900-page document you're working on and accidentally save a blank document over it without having some way to go back in time, you now have an empty document. So this is not backup. This is redundancy. This is what happens if a catastrophe occurs to that first drive. And it's also a concern, of course, because I have seen environments and heard about environments where you lose both drives at the same time. Always have a backup. Extremely important. Yes, and then the chat room, disk zero and disk one in that scenario, completely separate physical hard drives. It's pointless to do RAID 1 on the same drive. It's pointless to do any RAID on the same drives. We are talking about a physical disk 0 and a physical disk 1. That's an extremely important delineation. Thank you for that clarification in the chat room. Very, very nice. This is also uh, the RAID 5 is the other one you may have heard about. That's the other one I had in the question. This is striping with parity. So really, if you answered RAID 0, which was striping, you were correct. If you answered RAID 5, you were sort of correct, except it's not completely accurate. When we say somebody, oh, we're striping those drives, we're really talking about RAID 0. If we're doing RAID 1, we are striping across the drives, just like we're, we're looking at here. We put a little bit of the file on one drive. We put a little bit of the file on the other drive. We put a little bit of file on a third drive. Now, I thought RAID 0 was bad. Striping was bad, wasn't it? Well, the good part about RAID 0 and the striping part of it was that it was very fast, or at least an improved performance of what we wanted to do. So what we do in RAID 5, we take a parity of all of those drives, and we write some extra information on another disk, on another physical disk. The idea being is now we have redundancy. We're not duplicating information, but if we lose a physical drive, we can rebuild the information that happened to be on that physical drive with the parity information that was stored along with that stripe. On a previous, uh, a previous uh, study group, I had uh, an explanation. We stepped through how parity works. It's really ingenious. So that even if I lose a drive, I'm still running. So it's, it's a nice combination. I've got the benefits of striping. I've got the benefits of redundancy. And I would say that probably most server managers, if people are storing data, this tends to be the storage mechanism they look to at least first so that they can conserve disk space, but at the same time have some redundancy. Now, obviously, the calculations of that parity, that takes CPU cycles to store the parity. It takes CPU cycles to read if you lose a drive. So that's not something that uh, you may want to do just because you think it's a good idea. You may want to test it. You may want to use hardware-based RAID rather than RAID in an operating system because hardware tends to be a little faster. That's a different conversation unto itself, however. This calculation is pretty important, so make sure you, you check it out. Make sure that if you lose a drive and the performance hit is there, that it's something you can support in your organization. Although losing a drive and still being up and running, maybe the performance hit, not so big a deal for you. You'll know immediately if you lose a drive, you'll get information from your drive array that says this drive is bad. And generally, these RAID arrays are set up so you can just pull the bad drive out, put a new drive in while the system is running. Everything can, you don't shut down. 
no, no, we can't shut down the data center. It has a light on, a big red light. We pull out the drive where the big red light is. We push in a new drive, and then it rebuilds itself. Sometimes that rebuilding process can take hours or days, but it rebuilds itself. And then once it's back up and running, everybody's happy. Very, very, very useful to have that RAID 5 there. Now, for your A plus 800 series certification, you need to know another type of RAID called RAID 1 plus 0. This is also written often as RAID 10. RAID 1 plus 0 is what we usually call a stripe of mirrors. So let's say that we were looking at RAID 0, where we had those drives. And in RAID 0, if we lost any one of those drives, the stripe broke. But what if we took the drives that we were striping and we simply mirrored them? Block 1 on one pair, block 2 on another pair, block 3 on another pair. You've got a bunch of mirrors of a stripe, <laughs> really a stripe of a bunch of mirrors, because then at the top is really the RAID 0 part across all of those. RAID 1 plus 0. Put a bunch of mirrors in place. That way, if you can have RAID 0, but if you lose a drive, the RAID 0 still works. You're almost creating a redundant stripe, something you previously didn't have with RAID 0. So on the question I asked, which talked about this uh, and the redundancy that we have there, I asked, of course, what RAID type is commonly called striping? Let's make this so you can see it. RAID 0, the people that answered RAID 0, from a fundamental perspective, that was correct. However, we saw with RAID 5, we striped across and had a parity. So you get partial credit for RAID 5. And also for RAID 1 plus 0 is also partial credit for that as well. On your exam, you're not going to have a vague question like that. They're going to be very, very clear about that because different RAID types use different parities but or different streaming methodologies, striping methodologies. But you can, you can give me a little bit of slack on the study group. It was kind of a trick question. But it was there to make you think about how the striping works and the different ray types that use that type of technology and to get an idea of what's, what type of striping technology you would want to use. A question in the chat room um, is, so uh, what type of operating systems support RAID 0? What type of operating systems support RAID 1? And it's different depending on different operating systems. And, it's, and we're talking software-based RAID. Uh, Windows can perform mirroring on separate drives. It can perform striping on separate drives. There are a lot of functionalities. Different versions of Windows support different RAID types. So make sure you check your Windows edition. Even Windows 7 Home is different than Windows 7 Professional, which is different than Windows 7 Enterprise. Um, so make sure you look at your version of the operating system. And uh, this type of RAID functionality is supported practically in all major operating systems these days. If you're running Linux, you have the option to run the software-based RAID as part of the operating system. If you are in Mac OS X, you've got software-based RAID built into part of the operating system. And it's different from the different flavors of Mac OS X, whether you're running on a desktop or whether it's the server edition of Mac OS X. Now, I'm talking about operating systems because that's software-based RAID. We're telling the operating system to write the information to do two disks. But in a data center, you're not using software-based RAID. In a data center, you're using an a adapter card or something built into the motherboard of the server that you're using that knows all about doing RAID. It does it all in hardware. You connect all your drives up to that physical controller, and you tell the controller, please mirror across all these, or please do RAID 5, or please do RAID 1 plus 0 for me. And it does all of that and presents to the operating system a single drive. So in those particular cases, the operating system just sees one disk. You don't do software-based RAID in those scenarios. The operating system has no idea RAID is going on under the surface. The hardware of your computer is doing all of that RAID process for you. So most of the time, in a large environment, hardware RAID is absolutely the way to go. Just because it's faster, it tends to be um, a lot more uh, integrated into the hardware that you are using. So it becomes easier in many cases to be able to swap it out. You don't have to worry about the operating system seeing any of those things going on. But if you don't have a system with hardware-based RAID and you would like to be able to have that RAID functionality, use software-based RAID. Uh, it's what, in fact, I have a server that I use that doesn't have a RAID controller inside of it. I have to use hardware-based RAID to be able to do that, or, or excuse me, software-based RAID to be able to do that. Don't get as confused as I am. You'll be fine. We'll work on that piece in a future study group, I promise you. Let's go to uh, 
get you more involved with what's going on. Because I had another question that came in this month that talked all about the North Bridge. The question that came in uh, made me want to ask this question of you guys, which is, which of these would commonly be associated with the North Bridge chipset? And there's a list of those. If you go to VOT.RS and go to 88681, 88681, you can answer this question or take a picture of this with your QR code reader, which hopefully now is right there so that I don't have to talk a lot and leave this screen up for a long period of time. You can go to vote.rs, vot.rs, and go to 88681. And I'm going to flip over to vote.rs and have a look at that myself. Let's see what the answers are for this, which is the question was, I can find it on here. Which of these would be commonly associated with the North Bridge chipset? And so far, we've got disk transfers, RAM access, USB connectivity, or your mouse connection. 37 people, the vast majority of you, out of the 43 respondents, 44 respondents have said, it's accessing your memory. Duh, it's the North Bridge. I think we can probably guess at this point that that was indeed the proper response. That's uh, that's probably one that didn't fool anybody, did it? And then when we start looking at the architecture of a computer, that tends to be one of the first things that we tend to look at when we're working with those types of systems is the chipsets and understanding how things work on the inside of our computer. And I can say it's not disk transfers. It's not USB connectivity. It is not your mouse connection. That didn't fool anybody. A big donut, a big goose egg on the mouse connection. 47 of you, yes, it's RAM access. Of course we know it's accessing the memory. That makes perfect sense. So let's find out more about the question that was sent in then. If we know what, what the North Bridge is really doing for us, it would be nice to know more about this question that we are, have been asked about the North Bridge. And this question came in. Let's see if we can, can have this here. I'm trying to get my automated system here to give me my remote control back so I can talk and do multiple things at one time. The question that came in was, where is the North Bridge and South Bridge in today's computers? And MA asked this and said, uh, really, part of this question even went on a little bit more because she said, are these both together now? Is there really a North Bridge? And is there really a South Bridge? What is that all about? We're working with that. If you look at a motherboard, there's all kinds of components and pieces on side of it. And if you're looking at one that's a little bit older, all of these pieces will be very distinct. That you'll see that there is a physical Northbridge chip. There's a physical Southbridge chip. And when we talk about the chipset itself and all of those different pieces that go on the chipset, there's, there's a lot of pieces there. And when you look at your A-plus training, including the videos that I've created, we tend to keep these separated out so you can get a feel for the architecture. But keep in mind that some of the pieces of this architecture are now starting to combine together. The architecture is changing right under our nose. Pieces of these are being bridged together, being melded together in ways that allow us to do some really interesting things with the technology. The North Bridge is obviously, as we've already said, that's where, that's where the memory is. That's how we have the CPU talk directly to the memory. This gets really hot. That, excuse me, let me go back to that North Bridge. This North Bridge tends to get really hot. It's doing a lot of work. This is a high-speed chip. It's responsible for CPU talking to memory. That happens all the time, all day, every day. So the, the, you want that, that front side bus that is sending this information back and forth to really go very, very, very fast. That's why when we look at specifications of a new PC, they always tell you what speed is the front side bus so that you can understand, oh, that's really fast. That, that bus is really fast between there. Um, so also, there's a South Bridge. South Bridge tends to take care of everything else. So connections to your disks, connections of your mouse, connections of your, your BIOS, your onboard controllers, everything that is the secondary piece. Because you want the conversation to memory to be really over there and taking care of itself. Then you got the South Bridge over here. I'll handle everything else for you. Don't worry about everything else. I got that covered. You spend time having the CPU talk to the memory. And everybody's happy. So one of the questions that was presented, so are they merged together? Not really, not particularly. Well, kind of. 
but not sort of. We'll look at this in just a moment. We have all of these, these components. And if you were to look at a traditional computer, you would see the actual CPUs that were on the computer. You would be able to see exactly where the memory was. And physically on the machine, you'll probably see your Northbridge right in the middle of it. Pretty easy to find that chip. Obviously, in the other part of the motherboard, maybe they're close by, maybe they're not. Notice there are some geographic interesting views of this as we're looking at it, the PCI slot, your graphics controller, maybe a, the, the BIOS on your system, the chip that handles the input and output to your computer is generally all covered in the South Bridge. So in the chat room, you're already asking me about, OK, so what's the deal? Are they combined together or not? Can you answer the question already? Well, here it is. If you go and look at a chipset that's being used to in modern computers, I mean the latest stuff that has come out in the last month or so, you would get a feel for what those differences are. They are changing, as I mentioned, right now. They're under constant change. You, you have to keep up with all the latest hardware blogs. You have to listen to uh, the hardware um, podcasts to hear the changes that are happening almost every week. So a lot of the things that we just saw separated out into different boxes are starting to be put right inside the CPU. You notice a number of years ago that the major manufacturers, both Intel and AMD, bought companies that made graphics cards. And they told you at the time, graphics cards don't necessarily need to be anywhere else but on the CPU. We should be able to take graphics chips and the cards themselves, the chipsets, and don't you have them as separate chips on your motherboard, put them right into the main processor of the computer. And we are starting to see this. A good example is in Intel Sandy Bridge processors. They have processor cores inside of them. There is a memory controller. So the things that you used to see in this memory controller right here on the right side, system agent and memory controller, that's the Northbridge functionality. So get rid of the Northbridge, stick it onto the CPU itself. Well, that's, that's nifty. That means that there's so much more speed we can get out of that. And again, graphics processors. Here's your graphics processor. Don't have a separate chip on the motherboard. On the left side, a big chunk of the Intel Sandy Bridge, Bridge processor is those processor graphics. And there's at the bottom a memory controller I.O. So you've got a lot of the integrated processes now in your CPU that used to be separate chips themselves. We will still talk about these pieces. We will still talk about a North Bridge and a South Bridge and a separate video chip because a number of, of of even existing motherboards being made today still separate those things out. But the latest generation of processors are taking those pieces. So the question in the chat room, how does the CPU talk to RAM if, if the bridge is, is right here in the chip? Well, instead of taking that North Bridge and having it separate, it's now part of the CPU itself. It doesn't have to go across the bus to talk to it. It's effectively taking the same communication. But now instead of going across the bus, it's inside the chip itself, and now the chip can talk directly to memory. It doesn't have to pass through Northbridge, a physical Northbridge chip. The Northbridge is already in the CPU. Makes it that much faster to get those things going. If you've joined us while we've gotten going, we are uh, in the midst of our A-plus study group for the month of January. I have chat rooms going at the bottom of the ProfessorMesser.com website. And if you are on Ustream or using your IRC client to connect to the Ustream, then uh, there are directions there on the ProfessorMesser.com slash live to be able to do that. I'm watching both of those. So just find one you're comfortable with, and we will be just fine as we go along today. As usual, uh, almost every month I get somebody that says, here's a weird acronym. What's up with this? How does this work? Why is this here? What is that? And the, the one I got this month is, don't answer this in the chat room, but what is PCL? JH asked this specifically, and I want you to answer it. Go to VOT.RS, the number 9546119546. -11. Do not answer this in the chat room. Go to VOT.RS, pull out your QR code reader, take a snapshot of that little picture that will take you to VOT.RS. And ideally, it takes you to 9546119546. And answer this question about what is PCL? What is that? It sounds like a beach somewhere, doesn't it? it sounds like I should be going somewhere and drinking a, a nice drink with an umbrella in it. At at uh, we're down on PCL. You should come down to PCL with us and sit on the beach. Unfortunately, as it appears, the answers that we've gotten say it's nothing like a beach. You're completely off the mark. 
It is not programmable closed logic, does not appear to be policy configuration layer. It does not appear to be the penultimate change level. I have to work a long time to get these things out of my head, people. So you weren't fooled a bit, however. You have printer control language. You have heard this PCL before. You know that it is the printer control language. So let's find out more about PCL and how this came about. Why, why do we have a printer control language? And what kind of printer control language is this? There's all kinds of different printer control languages, and we should probably step through these pieces. When we first got these printers, you know, we we started this computing world that we're in, and there weren't really there weren't really common ways to print. Uh, everybody had just gotten a PC. IBM created this new computer, and on the back of it was a printer port. Up to that point, we had taken printouts that we'd created on our mainframes, and we sent them in to a central facility that had one of these enormous printers. When I was an operator, so the size of a desk, and it was really loud. They were these what they called chain printers with these enormous uh, ribbon cartridges that you had to replace into the big chain printer. That was the only way you printed things out. So when the first printers come out, you've got a printer. Well, how does the computer talk to the printer? Well, it uses its own language. It doesn't use what we see on the screen. It just, just doesn't take a snapshot of the screen and send it over to the printer. You have to some way take the information on the screen and tell the printer what that information looks like. Not exactly the clearest thing in the world to do, and everybody started doing it differently. Now imagine if, if your operating system had to understand every single printer because they all had a different language. The, a universal translator wasn't going to work here. So PCL is something that allows you to take the information that you want to print Make something very specific to the printer and send it along on its way. One of the first really common ways of doing this was with something called PostScript. This is something that wowed everybody. I think this is one of the reasons that we started to see Apple really take a lead in some of the higher level graphics and being able to do desktop publishing. If you worked with desktop publishing back in the day with your Apple Laser Writer, you were the bomb. You could print out stuff that was amazing. And you could send it to big printing houses, and they could also understand it. And the reason they understood it was because you were using a printer language called PostScript. This was one that was created by, I know I'm, I'm a little bit out of, the, out of the mark there, but this PostScript is still used today. Not really as much as it used to be, certainly at the higher levels and being able to go out and, and be able to, to work with high-level printing houses, you still use PostScript. But in our normal day-to-day, -day, in our home office, and even in our enterprises, we don't really use PostScript so much. It's a very complex printer language, but it was one that allowed us to take these complex designs on our screen, graphics, text, anything that we were creating, or anything that we wanted to build and print out, PostScript could do it extremely capable. It was made by Adobe. Now, one of the challenges with this, of course, is a, a printer manufacturer wanted to use that. They had to license that from Adobe. So a little bit of a challenge to be able to do that. The printer command language that HP created was generically called printer command language. When you hear PCL, it's talking about printer command language. Now, there have been many versions of PCL through the years. But if you have an HP printer, it talks PCL. It probably could also talk PostScript on certain printers. Some printers will understand multiple languages. Many people understand multiple languages. Same thing with printers as well. And the, the PCL has been updated through the years. And every time there is a new update to the language, they, they enhance the language. They create new capabilities. They allow you to interact with the printer in a different way. They have new versions. So you may see a PCL4, a PCL5, a PCL6. That's what that's referring to. But if you were just printing out a generic page of text, your printer's probably going to be able to recognize it regardless. The printer driver that you load onto your computer knows what printer you are talking to. It knows what language that printer communicates with. You don't have to know any of that. You just say, hey, could you please print this? Behind the scenes, the printer driver says, well, I'm printing to an HP laser printer. Let me change this to PCL5 and send it to that HP laser printer. You don't even know what happened. If you were to look at the text itself, it's just a bunch of weird-looking characters. It has some a bunch of numbers inside of it. Maybe some words you can understand, depending on the language that you're using, to talk to the printer. Now, what if you're not licensing Adobe and you're not HP? 
What if you wanted some type of printing language that was very generic that any Windows device could communicate with? You may even notice in your latest version of Windows, there's a printer called a Microsoft XML page specification, or XPS. You may buy a printer, and it says it's XPS compatible. Because it has a printer language that Microsoft has created as a generic language that every printer manufacturer or anybody who wanted to receive output from a machine can receive it in the standardized Microsoft XML page specification. And so in the chat room, we've already got the questions. Which one of these should I be using? Which one is better? Which one is, is the one that makes sense for me? Well, you may not have a choice. Your printer may talk PostScript. It probably doesn't. Your printer may talk HP if it's not a PCL. If it's not an HP printer, it probably doesn't talk PCL, but that's not entirely true. Some printers that are not HP printers will talk PCL. Some don't talk either of those. And you have to use the manufacturer's printer language, and they have to maintain this printer driver that understands their proprietary language. Or your printer might understand XPS. The answer to which one is better is which one gives you the output you're looking for. If you have a choice, choose the one that gives you the right output. Not one of these is better or worse than the other. If you are going to be sharing your printouts or you need to create something that you want to be identical on the other side, the industry has pretty much centralized on Adobe PostScript. So if you get into a job or you're working with technical people who are doing desktop publishing, they're sending information to a print house to be able to print out brochures. Uh, that is pretty important. And they're probably doing everything in PostScript. So don't be thrown the first time you see this, oh, you're using a PostScript printer. What's, what's that like? Well, to, to all of us behind the scenes, it looks like any other printer and works like any other printer, but it's PostScript for a reason. In fact, it costs a little bit more than the other printers for a reason. And that's because you need that extra capability that's there. OK. Another question that came in, where can I get the hands-on practice needed for the 802 exam without breaking my computer? This came in actually a, a number of times this month. People are saying, I need to study for my 802. I need to study for my 702. I need to study. And you know, I've tried doing virtual machines. I'm not a virtual machine guy. I don't want to go through the process. My computer won't run virtual machines. What am I going to do? Because I have to understand how to go through the process of fixing a computer that won't boot. And I don't want to take my computer that I use every day and mess it up so that it won't boot. That's not, that's not what I'm shooting for. But I want some hands-on work with this. So I went to my friends at GTS Learning, and I said, do you have anything that might be along these lines? I know you've already got amazing books that have been approved by CompTIA. I know you've got sample tests that you can take. I know that you've got Professor Messer videos integrated into all of that so that somebody can go to one place, read a section, my videos right there. But what about labs? People need to be able to try things out and test with labs as well. And they have a solution for that as well. It is uh, something that we're going to look at at professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. And I thought this was a smart idea that someone did, was to take the idea of labs and put it into an environment so that anybody could run it. So what if you, you didn't have a lab in your environment? What if you weren't able to do those things? We're going to try it here. And I know I'm running a lot of bandwidth while I'm doing the stream, but we're going to give it a shot. I thought, what? why not? You can, of course, go and try it for yourself at with the Freestyle Labs. But I thought we would do it on here. I'm logged into my Freestyle account. I can go and take tests. I can read the books that are here. You've probably seen me do that on previous study groups that I've done. But there is also practice labs right here built into Freestyle. And I can go in these labs. Uh, all these different course modules, I know they're very small, but zooming up on this creates problems for displaying it on the screen. So I'm kind of keeping it very generic. But you can kind of make out some of the text on the screen. I'm seeing what you're seeing on the screens that you're looking out. Pop it out and do full screen if you'd like. So a good example of this, I'm just scrolling down. Look at all these labs that are built into. These are step by step. Here's how you learn how to do these things. For instance, troubleshooting the boot process. I'm going to click on that. I'm going to see what comes up here. You've got a lot of different things you can do with troubleshooting the boot process. So it's going to go through, load up a bunch of things. It says, OK, you can do that, sure. It tells you this is a practice lab, takes you through a tutorial of how that works. I'm good, thanks. You can get rid of that. Here's all the labs, exercise one, exercise two. Let's see the process for the Windows boots and system files. And you can see it has a step-by-step -step process. Here's your lab. Do this, do that, do the other. But you can see it, it says, click this, power it on. What am I powering on? 
you're powering on a virtual lab that's available to you. On the right side of the screen, you've got a standalone server that's right here available to you. Let me get rid of my head so you can see that. There's the build the server. And you've got a power on button right there. Let's power on that server. So right now behind the scenes, if it's hard to see here, but the, the icon that is above that little server is one that is now starting up that Windows machine. And it's, it's, it's starting it from the very beginning. It's a real computer back there. And it's starting up the process on that device. And it's churning through. You can see the little icon at the top says, hold on, I'm working on it. Now, in the meantime, you may want to step through and see what are the process I go through to understand what the boot files are. And it's going to take you through understanding all those different pieces. As you mouse over the different graphics, it's going to pop the graphic up so you can see it. So you can get a feel for exactly step by step as I'm going through understanding how to do this, what it's going to take to make that happen. Once the server is booted, you can see the buttons change on this side. And now I can suspend it, I can reboot it, I can reset it, or I can connect to it. I can connect to a lab, just like I've got a computer. Yes, this is uses Java, so you Minecraft people will be right at home. So I'm going to say, yeah, absolutely run that. I want to be able to use this particular piece. And there are live labs for security. There's live labs for Network Plus. And the A Plus stuff, there's a lot of live labs here. Now, what I like about this is that I don't have to have a lot of computers around. They have Active Directory servers. There's Windows 7. There's Windows XP. There's Windows Vista. I don't have to have all of those things running on my computer. I don't have to have virtual machines for those. They look like they're right here in my browser. I haven't left my browser. But now I'm using this virtual environment as if it's real. And it's just in a tab. So I'm starting the process. And I can go back to my tab and go, OK, I started that. What's the next step? OK, it says, start the green button to turn on the PLABXPO2. All right, I can do that. Let's go to PLABX02. I'm going to highlight that one. Oh, this is it right here. And it says uh, to start it up. Well, let's do it. There's the, the green start button. There it goes. And it's going to now start up and begin the process. So I don't have to do anything. I don't have to build anything. I don't have to have it available to me. All I have to do is follow this step by step for it to tell me exactly what it needs to do. And then I can go to that and view it and see the full screen view of that. And it's running. You can see CPU usage. I can look at that one and connect to what it's doing, see, see the pieces that are inside of it. What a, what a nice front end to be able to work and be able to, to try anything. And I get to use this for a year while I'm studying this. There's no timeouts on that. No worries about those pieces. And now I'm going to be in my Windows XP environment and watch it boot up and be able to work with it as well. So I know we're not capturing my mouse. And now you can start working with different operating systems. I could have multiples up on the screen at the same time. I can start working with all of those. Now, I talked to the GTS Learning people because I went to their website. And I said, yeah, I saw the practice labs. I played around with them. Those were pretty nice. But they're, they're not inexpensive. If you've gone to the uh, professormesser.com slash freestyle labs, you'll see that they are $159. And I said, yeah, but this is my people. This is my study group. Can we do anything for them? They said, yeah, here's a coupon. So if you want to spend just $99 to use these, you can use this coupon code APMLABS, APMLABS-0113. And that's good for a limited time. I think they've set up that for me till the end of the January, end of this you know, calendar, end of this calendar month. So APM. Labs. It's A plus. Uh, actually, it's A A for A plus. PM for Professor Messer. Labs dash zero one one three. So that's that's something that might save you a little bit of money. And if you are someone like the question that came in that says I can't run virtual machine or I need to find out where to do labs, that might be something that might work for you. So you can find out all about that professormesser.com slash freestyle labs. Write down this coupon code right now. A P M Labs dash zero one one three. There is also a number of questions that come in to me when I'm I'm and they're not they're not technical questions about how to make a printer do a thing. It's more about I'm ready to take my exam and what can I do on this exam? Uh, or even better, and we talk about this all the time in our study groups. This isn't really part of the certification, but I think it applies to what you want to be able to think about because it's not just about taking a certification exam. You have to get a, a, a position. You have to be able to work um, and grow in that position. You want to do other things in IT. And the question was, how can I stand out in the IT world? IO asked this, and I thought this was an excellent question because it's one we struggle with, not just when you're getting started 
in the industry. It's also a question we struggle with when you are in the industry for years and years and years. I'm working with, um, in, in many of you know that the Professor Messer is something that I do as my, my other full-time job. I have another job. And I work with seasoned professionals. They're like, how can we, how can I, how can I really help with what I'm doing here? I want that new position. How can I go about and do that? I want to grow in my current position. What are the things I should concentrate on? So, of course, getting a job is the hard part, just getting in that position. You need certification. You need formal training. You need experience. You need all those pieces. But above and beyond that, it takes a lot of work to move up. You need to get involved with every project that you can. These projects that, that many organizations will work on really go above what your normal day-to-day -day might be. Maybe you work in the help desk, but there's a new project about deploying Windows 7. That would be a great thing in the help desk to go to your management and say, I'd love to get involved with that. I'd love to, I may not be able to, to write the automated scripts, but I want to see the guys that are writing the automated scripts. I want to help them deploy that piece so that I know exactly what's going on with that. As soon as you start working on those projects, now you're going to be extremely knowledgeable in those particular areas. Uh, I started off in a help desk, in a corporate help desk, uh, as I, my second job out of college. And in the corporate help desk, it came up, we needed to deploy and start using Windows 3.1. <laughs> this was a while back. So we started deploying Windows, and I got involved with the group that was deploying it. And then from that point on, I was known as the Windows 3.1 expert. Well, that's a great place to be if you're trying to move up now into desktop support, if you want to be able to manage servers, if you want to understand how to run the data center, if you want to go into databases, if you want to go into security or networking or whatever it happens to be. So I think whenever you get in the job, there are a lot of opportunities here. And I think getting certifications is another way to do it. Uh, I got an email this past week of somebody that said, I am um, working towards getting my certification because I want to be able to show my manager, this is how interested I am in networking. This is how interested I am in security. What can we do along those lines? And trust me, a good organization wants you to move into those positions. They would much, much, much rather hire you internally to move into those positions than hire someone from the outside much would much more would prefer doing that. So that's that's a piece that I think when you start looking at how you're going to handle what we're doing in our industry, it has to go beyond your normal day to day. You have to extend yourself and quite honestly start thinking about what interests you. When I started with technology, I was delivering printer cables. And I thought, what do I want to do? What what interests me? Well, workstations interest me. Operating systems really interested me. And I got certified in this Windows stuff. And I thought, this is the, and then I saw a protocol analyzer. I thought, networking is way cool. I can actually see that mysterious world that happens that nobody knows about when somebody logs onto a server, when somebody transfers a file, when somebody goes to a website. It wasn't a website at that time, but you know what I'm talking about. So we got to see how does that work. And I thought, networking, that's really interesting. And I, I started moving into that area. And then security is a, is a natural progression. Practically all of IT is a natural progression from networking. So it's a really good example of just taking your idea and following what you're passionate about, because I think that leads you and shows other people the things that you would like to be able to do as well. Pretty important. Uh, one of the questions that came in, do I need to have a lot of experience to pass this test? I thought that was a that was an insightful question. And, and the answer, of course, is that it depends. The A-plus certification specifically is one that is the entry-level certification. I often will hear people saying, well, I have, a, I have a Cisco certification. I have a Microsoft certification. I have a VMware certification. The A-plus certification is worthless. Well, yes, you have a Cisco certification. You have a VMware. You have a Microsoft. You know, you're not going to get an A-plus certification because that doesn't help you move up. You're already past the entry level. It, it, worthless, I guess, is a, a very bad way to talk about it. If you have never gotten into IT, you have never worked in a help desk, you've never helped people with a break fix, the A-plus is exactly the right certification that people are looking for. Go out to your big job boards, search for A-plus certification, search for CompTIA, search for help desk. Every single one of those help desk jobs will say, an A-plus is really going to help you. And because it does. But it's a very, very nice way to show people, I've got the basics. And I think that's one thing in our industry, and maybe even other industries as well, is people misunderstand the point of a certification. A certification is to make sure that is to show that you have gone through the process and make sure other people can see that you've gone through the process to understand the basic 
tips, the basic functionality, the basic use of a particular set of technologies. The certification is where you start. That's not, that's not saying you're an expert. That's not saying you're a guru. It's not saying you know everything there is to know about those topics. It's saying that I have a good foundation, and I know enough about it that I can build on that foundation. And I think that uh, people who perhaps misunderstand the point of certifications very often gets off track there. That's, that's one of the things that are uh, very important to think about. So from a point of A-plus needing a lot of experience, you need no experience to be able to pass the A-plus exam. You're going to learn a lot because the A-plus test is very broad. There are a lot of things you're going to need to know about with the A-plus certification. But I think that uh, you can start at ground zero and you work your way up. You do not need to know how to program and understand the binary language to be able to pass your A-plus certification. You need to understand when you look inside of a computer what you're looking at. Is that a hard drive? Is that memory? Is that a CPU? What do those things do? How do they interact together? And I think anybody can sit down, start from the very beginning, and very, very go through the process very, very easily of getting the information they need to pass and get their A-plus certification. Gary asked me, I don't know what you're talking about, Gary. If Do I leave anything out of my videos? What? Do I leave anything out? In fact, this was a concern of mine when I started making the videos. Do I leave anything out of my videos? Makes me think. I wanted to be sure when I started creating these videos and putting them on the internet for free, my goal was to make you something that was extremely comprehensive, that covered every single topic from every single exam, and it was better than anything else you could pay for. And the idea of of that led me to the road that Gary went down, which was, did I miss anything? So what I did was I went to the website for CompTIA. I just downloaded their objectives. First thing I did. Now it's what I do every time I start. I download the objectives for the certification. And you should too, because the objectives will have everything in there that you would ever need to know. And I know that if I can follow everything on the objectives and go through every single topic, then I've covered everything. Now CompTIA, of course, leads, they'll, they'll, they tell you, we reserve the right to go outside of this list of topics. But the reality is they stay right there with that list of topics. They really don't go very far away from that at all. So uh, use this as a checklist. This is a good final step before you go into the exam. Let's say that you didn't download the objectives, okay? Because some of you don't. That's okay. You've read through the books. You've watched the videos. You've effectively gone through all the information. Now, before you go into the exam, download the objectives and check off every single thing that you know on there. And you can look later and say, what did I not check off? I need to study some of those. And, and, and you'll have a great idea of some of the topics you need to spend all your time on. It is a long checklist in the chat rooms. Like, is that 40 pages? What is that? That's a very big checklist. There are quite a few pages. Now, the actual uh, exam requirements is about four or five pages long. There's a lot of detail on there. So be sure you check that out and make sure you've gone through all those pieces. There is a lot of content. I told you it was broad. I told you it was a big exam with lots of topics, um, and they're all in there. Whether you're taking your A-plus, your Network Plus, your Security Plus, your Microsoft exam, a Cisco exam, a, uh, a VMware exam, whatever you're taking, make sure you download the exam objectives for that organization. A-plus does a fantastic job. The CompTIA organization does a fantastic job of making these A-plus requirements very, very detailed, more than you're going to get anywhere else, I assure you. It's another reason these, these exams are so specific. AK is in another country, I think, if I recall properly. Want to know, if can I take the exam online? And there is not a way to do that. All of the exams for CompTIA are uh, Pearson View exams. That's the only organization they use for these. You have to go to an exam facility, and you have to be able to uh, sit down and sit in a room and be, be proctored, be watched, um, either in person or through a camera. Uh, they have ways to monitor what you're doing online, and it's a very, very controlled environment. And that's the way they make sure that no funny business is going on. Now, if you've worked with other organizations that have certification exams or, in some cases, accreditation-type exams, um, maybe it's a third party and you need to get accredited on how to use a particular device. You know, it's not one of the big companies. They'll give you online exams and give you an accreditation. Uh, but generally, if you're getting a certification you actually have to go somewhere, and that is the case with all of the CompTIA exams. You can't take them online anywhere. You must go to a facility. Some people sent me messages. Yes, I drove three hours to get to the closest facility. Now, if you go to the CompTIA.org uh, website, 
you can find out where the closest one is to you. But they had to be absolutely ready. Boy, talk about reading your exam objectives. They read their exam objectives before they drove for three hours just to take that piece. They're pretty important that uh, that you you think about what's going along those lines. So uh, so before you, for me, it's pretty easy. Mine's five minutes down the road. For other people, they're not so lucky. So you have to go there to be able to do that. Our link of the moment this week is one since I got that question about how can I do better? How can I uh, move up in IT? How can I gain the skills and the information and the visibility I need to move up in my organization? I thought, what do I use? You know, what are the things that that my my coworkers use to be able to get that visibility? And as you go through and get this this certification, as you get into IT, as you go to other organizations, you're going to meet a lot of people. And it's going to be really important that you maintain those relationships, at least at some level. There was a, a book I have. Um, I want to get the name right of this. It's just one that kind of, kind of I remember off the top of my head. I should get the name absolutely right before I tell you. But it's something like uh, don't, don't have lunch alone. Something like that. Never, never have lunch alone. I just, I just ruined the name of that book. Maybe some of the, the um, people in the chat room. I'm going to do a quick. I saw this guy talk. Uh, do a do a never eat alone. So this is uh, Keith Ferrazzi. Uh, it's called Never Eat Alone and Other Secrets to Success, One Relationship at a Time. And it's a book that talks about maintaining that that relationships you have with people because. Everybody has to work together to get through this world. And especially professionally, it becomes incredibly important. And I thought, how do I maintain this? Because I have organizations that I've worked with in California and in Florida. Those are very diverse groups of people. So in the U.S., and we perhaps overlook this sometime, LinkedIn is the way that professionals, at least in the United States, are using to keep in touch with everybody. Think of it as a Facebook without the games and the nonsense. Think of it as a professional group of people. And you know people, and now you see the people that your people know. You see the, the associates of your associates of your associates. And this can come in really handy. In fact, I was, uh, I was part of a business fraternity when I was in college. Uh, that means that um, it was sort of we had a fraternity, but we didn't do the things you would normally have in a fraternity house because we didn't have a fraternity house. One could argue perhaps it was not a fraternity. Again, it was a business fraternity. We showed up in coat and ties and we talked about business things. And we got to un talk to people in our, uh, our community about business leaders, about how do we get into doing more business-related things? How do I learn international marketing? How do I learn how to start my own business? Those types of things. And I found out on LinkedIn that someone I used to work with was also part of that fraternity. So I sent a message like, I had no idea that you were also doing something that I did. And, and we talked a little bit about that. Little things like that you can find out just by joining LinkedIn. If you're just starting into IT or any job, it doesn't have to be IT, any position professionally, or you're not in a position professionally, you're in college, you're getting a degree, you're working on a certification, get a LinkedIn profile. It's a great thing to put on your resume or your curriculum vitae, your CV, because now people can look to see the, more about you if they're really, really interested. And uh, a nice thing to have there. So go to LinkedIn.com to be able to do that. They've been around for quite some time. Some announcements. Now that we've gone over our time just a little bit this month, I apologize for a little bit of that. But for those of you that really want to watch what's going on, I plan on doing a lot more with Twitter in the next year. That's one of my New Year's resolutions. So uh, and this also helps a lot of what we do here at Messer Studios. Please follow us. Uh, go to professormesser.com slash Twitter. Another thing that is extremely useful, and I really don't promote it enough, is subscribe to me on YouTube. And you can go to professormesser.com slash YouTube to go right to my channel and click that subscribe button because the folks at Google see this and they say, we need to give this guy more video stuff. And I would love to do more video stuff for you. Again, thanks to GTS Learning in their Freestyle Labs. Make sure you check those out at Freestyle Labs. And I should have put the, the, uh, the uh, number in here for my, um, my coupon code. Let me let me pull up my coupon code again for you. See if I can find my coupon code. I had it on another one for that piece. I will give it to you in the show notes. And if you want to hang out after we're done with the stream, I'll absolutely. Hey, but thank you in the chat room. A P M Labs dash zero one one three. A for A plus P for Professor Messer Labs. 
0113, apmlabs-0113, and save a little money. If you need a lab, that's a great way to do it. They've worked really hard to build that up. We're going to do one of these every month. I, of course, do Network Plus study groups every month as well. I tend to have those a week apart, so next week will be Network Plus. If you want to know more about what we're doing here, professormesser.com slash calendar will help you out. And, of course, my thanks to you. We wouldn't be able to do these study groups if you guys didn't send me all these great questions, participate live, send me information in the chat room, send me the coupon code when I forget to put it in the slide, the, the second set of brains that I have telling me more information and doing the follow-ups. You make everything that much better, and you, you make it so that I'm able to do these every month. So I'm incredibly grateful for that as well. We thank you for joining us, and we will absolutely see you next time on the Professor Messer A-plus study group.